We've talked about the 4Kids dub dominating most English-speaking markets. We've talked about the Cineloom dub barely having any real reach. And now it's time to talk about the Accordifint in the room. Before 2010, Winx Club was a global phenomenon, to the point Rainbow SRL CEO Eugenio Straffi was considered the Walt Disney of Italy. The franchise, however, never truly had a chance to succeed in English-speaking regions, and with 4Kids losing the license to dub and distribute the series before it went bankrupt, and the much more faithful Cineloom dub only airing in Singapore and, for a very brief time, Australia, it was time for Rainbow to update their game plan. Which leads us to the good old folks over at Fuckalodeon. In 2010, Rainbow struck a deal with Nickelodeon to give the Winx Club brand, easily Rainbow's most successful franchise, a second chance in English-speaking markets. Straffi discussed the deal during an interview with World Screen in October 2010, in which he recounts Winx Club's difficulty, specifically in the US and UK, and praises Nickelodeon for their professionalism, even going as far to call them the most prestigious network in the world. The deal was simple. Rainbow would produce four one-hour specials to summarize the events of the first two seasons, which Nickelodeon would dub and release in English-speaking countries to quickly get new viewers invested in a version supposedly much closer to the original Italian version. They would then dub and air season three, the first movie, and season four, all done in approximately one year before the world premiere of the fifth season in the United States. On top of this, Nickelodeon would co-produce seasons five and six with Rainbow, and this deal was also Winx Club would at long last have a much more direct path towards mainstream English-speaking audiences. Jack Specific, meanwhile, would handle merchandising for the franchise in these regions. And with all of this, Rainbow would launch the franchise into a new golden age. Is that what happened, though? Of course not. If it did, I wouldn't be making this goddamn video. The one-hour specials premiered in the U.S. from June 2011 to October of that same year. While much of the voice cast comprised well-known voice actors, the Winx themselves boasted significant star power. Molly Quinn, best known for playing Alexis Castlon, Castle, would play Bloom. Kiki Palmer would play Aisha, a character who, up until the Nickelodeon deal, was referred to as Layla outside Italy. And you also had then Nickelodeon stars such as Matt Shively, Elizabeth Gillies, and Ariana Grande, yes, that Ariana Grande, as members of the supporting cast. Well, at least until Nickelodeon couldn't afford them anymore. These specials were... okay. For the most part, they were essentially just watered-down versions of the original scripts, haphazardly sewn together for a very brief summary of the original story's events. Season 2 especially, which for the most part consists of character-driven, self-contained stories that are honestly some of the series' best episodes, was boiled down to a very rushed and janky 40-minute special. Still, these specials, outside of leftover 4Kids fans screaming about Nick butchering their childhood, ironically, which was an even more butchered version of the original series, performed pretty well. Season 3 was then dubbed with this new cast and aired from November to December of 2011. Why did it finish so quickly? Well, Nick wanted to rush out the franchise's old stories so that they could get season 5 out by summer of 2012. This is why the specials were done in the first place, aside from updating the animation, which you'd think Rainbow would clean up for re-release, especially in season 3, but oh well. Season 3's episodes were aired on weekdays at 3pm Eastern Standard Time, which doesn't seem the best time to debut episodes, especially considering halfway through the season, episodes were suddenly shifted to 2 p.m. with absolutely no warning or indication. The dub itself was... Eh. A lot of the original dialogue was actually changed for the sake of... Yeah, I'm not even sure, but damn, do they try to jive with the youngins. Go back to Omega Trick! Or better yet, go make us some snow cones! I'll take raspberry! Is Misa just cursed to recite unrelatable pseudo-teenage slang for all time? On the bright side, we got Josh Keaton as a bad guy, and... Everything is going according to plan. Oh, this was a genius move. A little weird, considering Keaton also went on to voice King Oratel in this dub as well. You know, the guy Valtor tried to murder. Performances aren't even all that different, which, um... Uh... Okay. Without his courage, our world would still be frozen in ice. I'm going to be the supreme sorcerer of the magic dimension, and you're either with me or against me. Not his fault, really, but... Yo, voice direction. What's going on? The first movie, Secret of the Lost Kingdom, wasn't so different. 
Scenes cut from the Dubbing Brothers version of the movie were still cut in the Nick dub, and the television premiere kept getting pushed back from the end of January 2012 to mid-February, and then finally to mid-March. And then... Season 4. Oh, Season 4. Season 4 began airing on Sunday afternoons from May 6th to July 29th of 2012, with two episodes releasing a week. And my god, was the content watered down. The season 4 actually featured the girls having graduated from Althea, living on their own during their mission on Earth, and dealing with adult themes. When you love someone, sometimes one word is enough to sort things out or mess it up. That's true, so maybe we better not speak. <laughs> They had sex. Yes, this is real. The series never shied away from mature themes, usually keeping them as subtext, but you see, Puritanical America was not having any of it. The franchise had always received a lot of criticism over the years, primarily due to the girls being incredibly thin due to the series' art style, which was primarily based on fashion sketches, and also the girls' outfits being too revealing, which Fair. You can see the latter issue being remedied in the more modern seasons once Nickelodeon came around, but Nick also seemed to try to kidify the series so it might be appealing to younger viewers. Hence why all the season 3 episodes tend to air when the series' usual target audience of preteens and teenagers would still be in school. This resulted in this engagement... Words are escaping me, but well, Layla, will you marry me? ...was turned into this. I was wondering if you'd like to be my... Forever Girlfriend. <sighs> the second movie, Magical Adventure, is a strange case. Not only because its title is incredibly, unbelievably generic, but because it also doesn't work within the series' timeline. It was released in 2010, just after Season 4, but while the girls have Believix, the main transformation of the fourth season, in this film they never refer to it directly as Believix. Likewise, plot points from Season 4, such as Roxy's existence, the fairy pets, Magic returning to Earth, and Nabu being… dead, directly contradict the events of Season 4, and there's no real point after the Winx earned Believix where this movie makes sense timeline-wise. Rumor has it the second movie and fourth season were both in production at the same time under different teams, and the second film was meant to take place between the first film and the fourth season, with the Winx using Enchantix, which literally fixes every single problem. But then, hey, marketing is like, that sounds cool, but we really think we can make some more cash by selling more Believix merch, so have them use Believix instead. And lo and behold, the second movie instantly makes zero sense. Yet it's still required for the demise of the Ancestral Witches, so... thanks, I hate it. How did Nickelodeon handle it? Well, they didn't actually air the second movie till three quarters of the way through season five, which makes even less sense timeline-wise, but whatever. But instead of dubbing the whole movie, they butchered it and turned it into a one-hour special with a heavily altered plot as usual. Again, kidified themes are present, where Bloom and Sky's engagement... Now I'm asking you to accept the most difficult challenge of all. Which is? Living together. Forever. Bloom, will you marry me? Oh, Sky! <sighs> which... Still makes no sense, because they got engaged at the end of the first movie, so why are they getting engaged again? Turns into... I was wondering if you... Yes, guy? The, the princess ball. I wondered, Bloom, will you go with me? <gasps> oh, Sky! Thanks, I hate it. So that's how Nick haphazardly caught up new fans so that they could have the honor of giving season 5 its world premiere themselves in the US. So did these new seasons serve as incredible new stories for the franchise that would continue to develop and mature the characters with the new opportunities the end of season 4 presented them with? Of course they didn't. We already covered this. I wouldn't be making this video if they did that. I most certainly wouldn't be an alcoholic if that were the case, I can tell you that. Up until this point, Rainbow would produce the series first in Italy, the Italian voice cast would record the scripts, the Italian animators would get to work, and somewhere down the line, bam, you get your episode. For season 5, however, Nickelodeon's cast comprised the voices the animators worked to, recording scripts written by professional writers from both Rainbow and Nickelodeon. This was a co-production, after all, meaning Nickelodeon had partial ownership over not only season 5, but season 6 as well. And they also got say over certain elements. 
Gee, I wonder which ones. Season 5's world premiere was on Nickelodeon in the United States on August 26, 2012, and despite the open door to new possibilities the end of Season 4 had left the series with, Season 5 instead decided to slam that door shut and then run right back to square one. By this I mean Season 5, rather than experiment with new storylines dealing with magic having returned to Earth, and with the Winks now in their early 20s continuing to grow and mature as they mentor the young Roxy, instead opted to forget all of that, pretend the Winks were 16 again, and sit them back down for a Palladium's Potionology lecture at Elphia. Winx Club was actually unlike a lot of cartoons in that it allowed its main cast to grow up outside the status quo it had established in Season 1. Having graduated from Elphia in The Secret of the Lost Kingdom, the Winx spent Season 4 finding themselves and trying to figure out exactly what they wanted to do outside just being guardian fairies of the magical universe all while dealing with the crushing weight and the fact that the Black Circle were trying to exterminate all magic on Earth, while the terrestrial fairies were brandishing their battle axes to wipe out humanity for, you know, fucking up the planet. It was a wild time. And Season 4 wound up actually raising the stakes by having Naboo, Aisha's romantic partner who was actually engaged to her, sacrifice himself to save the Earth fairies, and Aisha struggled in wanting to avenge his death and her friendship with the Winx as a result. Season 4 had its problems, mainly with that goddamn love and pet shop and the weird romantic quarrels in the beginning of the season, but I feel all of these positives outweigh the negatives. Though all of this was covered in Nickelodeon's dub of Season 4, albeit massively watered down, Season 5 returned the Wings to Elphia as students, not as professors or even teaching assistants like the Nick dub posited. We're just teaching assistant, but it is pretty fantastic. And instead introduced a new villain, Tritanus, aka whiny unthreatening sushi roll gone bad with the behavior and voice of an agey 14 year old boy. I will make my father regret that he chose my brother over me! Wow, such character depth. You can really sense the depth, complex moral failings of this character and his pursuit of power. Like, you had a decent bid for a new villain. And you floundered. God damn it, Bar! So Tritanus is incredibly unthreatening, and the tricks wind up working under him because the tricks were absent from season four, and Corporate wanted to go back to the show's roots, so they're back. Yay. Oh, and also Icy and Tritanus are a thing, apparently? Like, at first it's sometimes suggested Icy is manipulating Tritanus. I knew I could count on you, Tritanus. And then at other points it's the other way around. Together. And then somehow it's mutual. Tritanus, no! <laughs> that did not just happen. Until Tritanus goes all evil, red eye, and the romance is just for forgotten. The I mean, it's definitely toxic. God damn it, bo Roxy takes a backseat most of this season, being forbidden from transforming and helping in the first two episodes, and then basically being told to get lost once the wings get to Ophia, because I guess Nickelodeon doesn't think she's cool enough to be in the main six. Was she unpopular or something? Cause like the fandom seemed to love her last I checked. Is this a branding thing? Oh, whatever. Magic on Earth is relegated to nothing more than haphazardly explaining Tritanus' source of powers, toxins. It's toxic. I need more pollution. I've never seen so much garbage. It's perfect. Garbage, pollution, it's very Captain Planet up in here all of a sudden. I mean, A for effort in trying to hammer that pollution is bad, but like, I think you're just hurting your cause, Rainbow. And sometimes when the plot demands more time to appear, Tritanus goes, oh no, I, I've gotta run, uh, go get some pollution, cause I ran out, cause I guess that's how being a mutant works. <laughs> Fuck you! And of course, dual transformations. Rainbow wanted to sell more toys, or at the very least, Nickelodeon wanted to sell more toys. So since having two extra Beliefix variants and three sets of special wings did season four pretty well, let's just have two entirely separate transformations a season. And thus, Harmonix and Sirenix were born. Harmonix is probably my favorite aesthetically, though its purpose it, it does not exist. It does not have a purpose. Like, oh no, our Beliefix powers don't work underwater and our wings are the size of monster trucks, so I, I guess we need to pursue this ancient source of power that in the wrong hands could result in the death of everyone we, we know and love, which they would not have known about if we hadn't gone looking for it in the first place. 
Yeah. Your powers as Belivix fairies are great, but far from land, in the worlds of water, they are less effective. But try to you must try to acquire Cyrenics. You must try to acquire Cyrenics. There was a leak before season five debuted that featured unfinished animations, then a prototype version of the harmonic song in which the lyrics referred to something called like nature's key. The term is actually used in episode six when the Winx befriend this toyetic rainbow horse and please this weird tray lady. You have earned my boon, nature's key. But for some reason, this isn't how they earn harmonics. And no, instead, this allows them to open the Cyrenics book to begin their quest, which- Your guardians have granted you a new fairy power, harmonics. It will allow you to swim faster and use your powers freely in the ocean. You must try to acquire Cyrenics. The book gives them harmonics to get Cyrenics. Uh, what was, is there a reason for that change or like? What? Never mind this weird, pointless Grey North thing only lasted like half a goddamn episode, but the whole point seemed to be trying to get the Wings to agree to go along with the Cyrenix quest, but it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Like, all that really happens is they throw out a line or two each on whatever contrived character arc, quote unquote, they're gonna have this season, and then... If we complete the quest, maybe we can break the Cyrenix curse. Maybe we can help your sister Daphne. I finally get it. And I've thought of something. These enchanted strawberries will attract magical creatures. When your friends want to throw away their lives for some useless ancient curse transformation, but you just want to take a nap and eat some strawberries. You must try to acquire Cyrenix. Oh, great. Just when I thought we were done. Oh yeah, and Cyrenix is cursed, apparently. Why? I don't know. Some weird retcon no one understands to this day, and that fucks up the timeline and winds up negating Daphne sacrificing her life to save Bloom by making her corporeal again. Oh yeah, they brought Daphne back from the dead. But not Musa's mother, because Musa doesn't sell us enough toys. And how could any of us forget the CGI? Wow, cool! <gasps> wow! Awesome! Yeah, for some reason, both seasons five and six feature gimmicky universes where everything is this ugly CGI rainbow and Nick outsourced on one part for superficial marketing and another part because it's cheaper than the already cheap and lazily implemented 2D flash animation. Oh, and it also lets us copy and paste like 75% of season five's animation and turn them into a third movie just to make even more money. This is obviously gonna take longer than I thought and I'm double parked. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not joking, but weirdly enough, this movie actually isn't totally abysmal. <laughs> Get it? Because cause it's, it's the mystery of the abyss. It's a real mystery how this terrible season came out of the abyss. God damn but for all its problems, season five at least had the foundation for a pretty good story. If only the writers didn't focus on kidifying all the storylines for the sake of keeping to the original Winx brand, minus all the actual maturity and good writing that takes actual effort to portray. Just rehash Techno learning how to people and Misa talking about her dead mom and give Sky amnesia for half the season before bringing back Diaspro, who for some reason is given a position of authority despite having been banished from Heraklion for working with a fucking terrorist to take over an entire planet's government from within and call it a day. It's at least leagues, leagues better than season six. Season six doesn't even really try with its story. Basically, we have Selena, who was Bloom's childhood friend who we would never heard about until just now, working under the tricks with her own agenda in freeing the dark sorcerer Ashron from the Legendarium, a book which can bring fairy tale characters and creatures to life. Why is Selena just showing up now of all times? Rainbow needed a villain for this season. The Winx just kind of flounder around most of this season, getting the new transformation Blue Mix. No, I'm not joking, that's actually what it's called. Pieces of Bloom's dragon flame are in all of you, and special acts of courage will grant you the Blue Mix power. Through goddamn backflips of all things, grabbing pointless MacGuffins, and opening a music cafe. What? The big bad Ashron isn't even that intimidating. He's not even here for a whole episode. He just shows up for like five minutes in a poorly choreographed fight with Bloom and then gets trapped in boxes ex machina so we can fight the tricks because the nostalgia, I guess. Yeah, season six was supposed to be a nostalgic season for the series 10 year anniversary and it, mm, ah. 
It's by far the weakest season in terms of writing and plot. The tricks are incompetent with no real plan. Selena's a boring villain with superficial motivations. Trust Eldora! Eldora was lame. She just wanted me to follow the rules. Then an even more superficial connection to Bloom they don't even really try to take advantage of. And Asheron is... Boxus ex machinus. Selena declared her loyalty to Asheron. I choose you, Asheron. What are you doing? No! It's also home to the series' worst transformation, Mythics. Season 5 started the trend of the Wings gaining specialized transformations, so instead of just going for a basic form more powerful than the one that came before it every season, they usually get a transformation with a special power or ability they would need for a specific mission. These include Sirenics, which they needed for underwater missions, Butterflix for connecting with nature, Tynix for entering mini worlds, which we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there next video. And Mythics. Mythics was kind of actually interesting at first, just like everything else in these two seasons, since it had more in common with traditional fairy archetypes than other transformations. It's essentially like the first fairy form which allowed the Winx to enter the realm of fairy tales, and even gave them conveniently merchandisable fairy godmother wands, now available at a target near you. You know, if Jack Specific ever gets around to producing them. But Mythics is so boring. The designs are plain. It's a CGI only transformation, so we don't even get to see a 2D incarnation save for this one glance of concept art, maybe? I mean, at least the song's good, but that's a given with Wings Club transformations. <laughs> Season 6 was a bust, to the point Nickelodeon aired it irregularly in two episode bunches, the first episode which had nothing to do with the fairy tale plot, it was, was instead about Daphne getting her groove back. <laughs> wow, I really love Daphne being alive again. Like genuinely, I love Elizabeth Gillies' uh, performance and portrayal of Daphne in this dub. It's actually like probably the best voice she's ever had and it's fantastic. But everything else, thanks, I hate it. And then we got episodes 2 and 3 on November 3rd, episodes 4 and 5 on December 15th, episode 6 on January 12th, 2014, 7 and 8 on February 16th, and then episodes 9 through 14 and maybe 15 or 16, citation is weird on that, online only on the Nick website. Legend of Korra fans should recognize this is a very large red flag. The rest of the season dropped on Nick Jr. and that is where the series remains as far as I'm aware. Turns out the most prestigious network in the world ain't all it's cracked up to be. From the get-go, there seemed to be a miscommunication in what the series was all about. Wings Club may have been a kid's show primarily meant to move merchandise, but Rainbow always put effort into its storytelling. Characters were interesting, as were the fantastical worlds they created. And they even dropped some mature themes here and there, such as characters possibly getting buzzed at a club because one of them is facing the crippling existential horrors of being forever alone, and possibly some even LGBT hints. I did it! I saved you, Professor! That poisonous flower, now I remember. Thank you so much. Don't mention it. Only did my duty. I, I see you, Rainbow. I see you. Rainbow were the real heroes. I mean, they had goddamn Aisha, a well-respected black princess with probably the best powers of the wings introduced as a main character back in 2005. I'm not the most versed on this particular type of representation, but... Give credit where it's due, I say. Ultimately, the show was meant to appeal to both kids and teenagers, and the movie featuring the Winks graduating in season four following their lives as new adults made moves most other animated series avoid like the plague. The Winks never stopped growing up alongside their audience. Until Nickelodeon came along. In an interview with World Screen back in October 2010, Thrafi discussed his excitement at the prospect of working with Nickelodeon, not only having them distribute the series in English-speaking regions, markets where the franchise never really had a chance to gain a footing, but also co-produce new seasons to continue the adventures for fans across the globe. Thrafi even praised Nickelodeon's professionalism, their understanding of younger demographics, and even called them the most prestigious network in the world. 
and oh boy would he change his tune. Not allowed, of course, but uh, yeah, I think we all hate Nickelodeon just a little bit more now. Because Nickelodeon only dubbed the one hour special summarizing seasons one and two, they wound up skipping over a lot of solid character depth and development, specifically Tecna's issues in dealing with her emotions and being vulnerable, Aisha struggling and accepting she has friends while struggling with her persistent loneliness, and Musa's conflict with her father on whether to pursue music as a career like her mother, who passed away in poverty specifically because their music didn't bring enough funds in to keep her well. Which is odd. You'd think the magical universe of all places would have universal health care. Did it only have that in 2005? I know they have it now, but give me a moment. Yeah, 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 they did. Uh, they, they actually started up their uh, National Health Service in 1978, hot damn. And they rank in the top 10 in the world. Eh, go Italy. Yeah. Anyways, Musa's mom is dead, a thing which we did not learn in the Nick dub till this moment. All that ever existed still exists here. <gasps> mom? To be fair, Romy Dames did this scene so much justice. Like, oh, this scene always, like, reminds me why Muse is my favorite. I want to be with you more than anything in the world. I want to feel your arms around me. I want to laugh with you and sing together the way we used to. The entire universe is depending on me. I have to go, Mom. <laughs> oh, oh, fuck. Oh. Uh, oh, God. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm proud of you, sweetheart. I love you, Mom. But from the start, it was clear Nick wanted to keep the wings from growing up. After all, it's much easier to crank out seasons one after another when they're perpetually 16-year-old Ophia students going on random adventures of the day, gaining two transformations per season with watercolor hair available at a Walmart near you. Well, except Musa and Tecna. They're apparently not popular enough for, for Jack Specific to care about. I mean, they'll, they'll make commercials promising the merchandise for them soon, but um, they in the graveyard now. So in season five, the Winks aren't explicitly aged down, but even though they graduated, they're for some reason attending classes at Alfia again. And with poor ratings from dissatisfied fans, along with airing episodes at weird times no one was watching, eventually Nick just gave up and threw the series into the fires of Nick Jr. Nickelodeon's parent company, the Lords of Hellfire and Evil themselves, Viacom, still holds stock in Rainbow. Though while Nickelodeon may still distribute the series, albeit barely, the deal to co-produce the series ended after season six. Rainbow noted that there was a misunderstanding of what Winx Club was, and that the series was not another show for very young children like SpongeBob or Dora the Explorer. This shift in tone across the last two seasons, however, served as permanent damage to the franchise's perception globally. Season seven, which was likely partially planned with input from Nickelodeon writers and executives given how quickly it came out after season six, was particularly kiddie despite the absence of Nickelodeon. And following its end, Rainbow quickly moved to strategize and rebrand the series to survive in the wake of this disastrous deal. Ultimately, it's an ironic shame in that Rainbow's attempt to at long last expand the Wings Club's success into English-speaking markets wound up nearly destroying it. The series is still going pretty strong, season 8 thus far is actually pretty good, as is the more mature spin-off World of Winx. And there's some live action projects in the works as well, but a lot of that power comes from Rainbow's shift towards digital markets, be they on YouTube, social media such as Instagram, or via Netflix. So next time we're going to be discussing where the franchise is now, following the end of the Nickelodeon deal more in depth, and where it might go from here. But today I hope you learned, if you ever find yourself <laughs> making a multi-billion dollar franchise, and you're struggling with getting into certain markets and Nickelodeon offers you a deal, don't take it. Literally do anything else. They should have gone with Disney, honestly. The, going with Disney would have made more sense. Like, y'all agree, right? Like, yeah, Disney owns everything. They're a corporate monster, but at least they would have access to Disney money and Disney writers. Like, and you can even, you could even have winks in like the theme parks. Like, if you enjoyed today's video and would like to see more content from me, then you can not only subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators, but also check out my other videos, pledge your support over on Patreon so that I cannot starve to death, and or check out the links to my work in progress curse book in the description below, it's killing me inside. I'm the Unicorn of War and this, like the Winx Club franchise and the Nickelodeon deal, has been a shit show.